Hello, my name is Jerome Rose, and I'm sitting in my apartment on the Upper West Side of Broadway in New York City. I have been invited by the International List Competition of Utrecht, Netherlands, to talk about the Grand Sonata in B minor of Franz Liszt. This is a composition very close to my heart, as it is to countless pianists. The work has an, a great history. Every great pianist has performed this and has put his stamp on it. But none of them have actually sat down to explain why they are interpreting the sonata in this particular way. In my, my demonstration, I'm hoping to at least bring you into the construction and the form and the analysis of the piece, because I feel it's essential to actually expressing the greatness of the music. It, it is really a paradoxical work. It is a, a work of extremes. It is the diabolical. It is divine. It is a personalized autobiography of Franz Liszt. You have to understand that at the time he had written this piece, he was very involved with conducting in Weimar. He had already conducted operas of uh, Verdi, he conducted operas of, of Weber, Berlioz was conducted, he knew Wagner, he knew all the great works of his time, intimate friend of Mendelssohn, Schumann, Chopin, aware of all the great sonatas which had previously been written. So putting his stamp in his own sonata and personalizing it was extremely important to him. And indeed, if you hear the piece, which you will, you will see how he is so advanced harmonically and through the use of all the techniques of musical composition through counterpoint, motivic development, transfiguration. It is such an emotional work and yet such an analytical work of such proportions that obviously he had to put it down. It's like words, the meaning of the words comes after the word. So you have to understand what the notes are in order to understand the meaning. So this is what it is. I believe it is also an opera fantasy. It is a work for opera, not just for symphony, not just for the piano. I believe it is something so beyond just a piano sonata that it has proportions of a grand opera. And indeed, I would like to add what I believe would be a kind of libretto to words that would actually explain what is happening within the music itself. You have to understand, this is a man who had already composed 20 different opera transcriptions. He had uh, transcribed numerous songs of Schumann and Schubert. He was a devotee of Beethoven, Schubert, and all the great composers. He had actually edited all these pieces. He had already played the Hammerklavier Sonata. He had toured the world, played for every royal figure of Europe. He was the toast of Europe, and he was living in Weimar, and he wanted to create the great sonata of his time, and indeed, I believe he did. So let me begin with the B minor sonata, which he calls Grand Sonata of Franz Liszt. Now, we have to start already from the beginning by understanding what is happening. He starts out piano, sotto voce. It is known as the great B minor sonata, but indeed, where is B minor? Starts with his Gs, which I believe should be played in a pizzicato manner, similar to what a great symphony orchestra. I somehow imagine a great conductor showing his hand to the cello section, and the cello section goes boom. Boom. The rests are enormous. The silence is deafening, and yet there's the stillness in the hall, and here this great, great work is about to begin. Now, try to remember this because this particular theme is not often thought of as a great theme, but it's one of the great motives of the piece. And he uses this throughout the composition for various reasons. The offbeat Gs, the downward scale, and then what is known as the Phrygian mode, and it's half step from the tonic to the supertonic. And then he uses what is actually labeled the gypsy 
Phrygian. Quite fascinating. So at the very beginning of the piece, you have a duality of the, what is known, and was, this was coined half gypsy, half friar, half priest. And this is immediate from the very beginning, you have a, a conflict and a polarity of two different scales being used. He later continues on with his, one of the main themes. So we already have one main theme from the descending scale. Now you have your... Dramatic, forceful. Most pianists start, um, start forte. You should start more piano because you're coming out of the piano up to the forte. But the two diminished sevenths chords, which is one of the most strongest motives through the entire piece. The next strongest motive is what I consider the Mephistophelian character, and it's extremely dramatic. There's a Now, most pianists play it this way. I believe this is incorrect, and it's, I think it's contrary to what the music has written. I believe the, the minor second should be brought out in its em emphasis. And I see. I believe this because of the continuation, which is a diminution of. What do you have here? But the beginning. is taken over here. Because you have it from the very beginning. He comes back to it here. And finally, we're in B minor, but it is the most critical B minor. There's nothing taking place that makes you learn. Nothing like that. He's taking his two motives and uh, and the clash of the two. Even more fascinating is the use of the tritone, which is considered terzo di diavolo, the devil's third. Seventh being carried forward. Interestingly, uh, he has the diminished chord and a seventh. Where most composers continue this, he changes it. Once again, contrast, contrast, contrast. Once again, his theme in B flat major. What most pianists do, to me, they lose the rhythm. I really believe that. It should be heard. And this is part of it, but the most pianists lose the right hand.
what is happening here? B flat major. Followed by G minor. Followed by E flat. The first three forties. Constantly using the E flat major. But it, what's happening within the A flat, he has to change his A flat to A in order to get to his dominant. And you'll hear how he does this. Uh. Now remember, I said you should try to remember uh. Major seventh. Now look at the dramatic. Uh. Augmented second. It's seven. So here, from the A. finally becoming the dominant to his grandioso, which is his main, main theme. What needs to be considered is he still is very conscious of sonata form. And the D major is absolutely the reason from the B minor to his third, which is his D major. Huh? So much has been written about this particular theme. And my good friend Tibor Satz, in one of his uh, great dissertations, has absolutely believed this is the, the motive of the Christ motive. And the reason he believes this is this motive was used in later compositions of Liszt Christus and uh, the, the Akrusius and the Hunenschlag. Uh, but this is all after the fact. To me, this is really a uh, be beatified um, theme that Liszt has used, which is very close to his heart. And th how this gets transformed is, is, is a dramatic moment in the piece, which is beyond belief. And I'll, we will get to that point. But listen again. <laughs> great mistakes that uh, many pianists make in performing this piece is they start this much too loud. The fortissimo. Liszt is actually building this up as he climbs up his, his uh, pentatonic scale. And uh, what you have here with the three fortes, he even goes beyond his three fortes to a sforzando, which is the great dramatic which is his Phrygian of the D major. Which is all. Once again, the Phrygian relationships. He go 
goes into C sharp major, A flat major. These are in flat keys. These are in sharp keys. These are in flat keys. His famous diminished chord. But what he does is he takes you back. His main theme, and look how he expresses this in piano. is pianissimo F major. beautiful transformations in all of music here uh a variation on the interestingly enough um, within the D major he has still only gone from his B minor to his D major and you have to be fixated on his concept of sonata form where he has to go from the D major and eventually to his F sharp major and how he does this is really quite a quite a lesson in compositional technique because there's so much drama taking place how he goes from this to this finally reaching his dominance so listen to what's going on this is the variation of which is the theme Now, which is his theme, look what he does. Now look what he does here. This is his Mephistophelian theme. Interrupted with a subito piano and his F sharp major in 6 4. But is it a true dominant? It's a true movement. No, it's not. You'll hear how it goes.
get to C major. B major, 6-4. F7. expecting some huge climax and some huge moment of arrival. The F7 becomes... Comes, comes in do it, in do it here. Now this theme, the famous... is now transformed into D major. Now we're not bum 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 is Mephistophelian theme. happened, he's building up this tremendous source of energy. Now remember these two G's? So what you have here... Uh you have a, a, an E7 going nowhere. He breaks, and the, the drama goes in. The two, remember the two G's? Dum, bum, so. Uh, What is it? No. Suddenly, the transformation of the theme to the most brutal three fortes, pesante, C sharp minor in the six four. Oh. He even gets there. Oh.
mixture of themes. What you have in the recitativo, um, it is a belief, and according to custom, that I, whether or not it is true, this is the crucifixion of the Christ theme or the Christ figure. Um, certainly, it is brutal in its uh, dr drama and followed by a recitativo, which is actually agonizing if you think of hearing it for the first time. And of course, no one, no one believed what was going on because no one had ever composed like this before. Uh, I can imagine what Clara Schumann thought when Brahms first played it for her after the publication 18, uh, 1854. Um, but if you just listen to the dissonances and the, the clash of, of drama and the use of the diminished sevenths chords and how he uses this, listen to again. <laughs> Now, the appearance of a satanic figure. of the two themes, the two characters. And I want you to remember the B is very important because he brings it back at one of the most sublime moments of the piece that you should never forget that the devil is always behind you. It's the satanic figure, the shadow of the satanic figure is always there. But how he continues. pianos on the una corda. And he doesn't give you a piano, he doesn't give you a mezzo piano, he doesn't give you a crescendo. There's a slight fork. He's finally arrived at his F sharp major. satanic figure in the A major, the relative major of F sharp major. Mm. 
once again to try his own relationship. comes back to his in the F sharp major. He doesn't bring it back fortissimo, he brings it back in a mezzo forte form and you'll see how this is transformed. because following his great beautiful theme he has in an E minor on the dominant you hear this he brings it back here famous F sharp major beautiful theme has been transformed to the glorious <laughs> expecting and I'll show you how Liszt throws you a complete curve but let me just play again uh, and how and then the great climactic point uh, reach of the seventh it becomes a motive Their composer would have done. Then, which he does, he goes back to his original opening of the piece. But what Liszt does, he creates a tremendously gorgeous episode. And listen to how he does this. They 
extending the dominant of F sharp major. Augmented second, which is very important, which you will hear at the very end of the piece. So, what do we have here? He does not want to leave his F sharp major without giving due deference to all the themes. So, he has these and he has which is, but here he wants to do his great transformation of the Mephistophelian theme as well in his dominant key. Carried over a in his great seventh. And again, you have the three pianos. goes back to the very beginning but he's not on G or in, even in B minor he's in F sharp major but it's really not even F sharp major it should be but not list list will never be conventional sharp and the F sharp becomes G flat in his B flat minor fugato so people believe that the middle section is a slow movement and this is a kind of a scherzo I don't believe it all. I believe it's an absolutely through composed piece by the use of the themes, by the use of the harmonies, and by the continuation of motivic development. What, what is he going to do? Once he's, he's brought you back, but he's not in B minor, he's in his dominant key. So what does he do? He has to bring you back, somehow bring you back to B minor. And he does this in a development section of the sonata. This is not a scherzo, a, a different movement. This is the development section of his sonata, the fugato.
so on. But what you have here, of course, is... Which is developed. Of course, he has this one, and then he has, of course, uh, which is the Mephistophelian, his Mephistophelian theme, working in together. Uh, magnificently done. I'll show you how he develops this also in, as he continues his fugato. Let me play that again. The two themes. Tremendous in its imagination because he has, um, which is his theme, and then he has the inversion of the theme. And he puts the two together. Um, beginning of his piece and he does it in dotted rhythms <laughs> uh, which is you one might consider this a recapitulation but it's not exactly in a B minor setting this is E flat <laughs> with his famous diminished <laughs> Finally coming back to his B minor. Instead of coming to a, um, he comes up to his E flat major chord. But what he does with the E flat major chord is amazing because he completely shatters what you expect, which is um, is B flat and E flat major. What he does complete caesura, complete interruption. And let me go to let me show you how this is exercised because you will not believe the drama of it. Um, Remember these? At the very beginning of the piece, listen what he does. sharp pedal point, which is the dominant of his B minor. Yeah, listen to the dissonance. What is this? Which is played out the two themes together. Does it? And what does he have here? 
here, but a diminution. A diminution. building up this tremendous force. Beating the devil. This isn't grand opera. I don't know what music is. Three fortes. The devil theme. <laughs> Christ figure, but certainly the spiritual, the, the inner glorious life of a life well served. And he bringing it back in a mezzo forte, beginning the first time it comes back, it comes back fortissimo. Here he's bringing it back mezzo forte. He's saving this theme for the very end of his piece. <laughs> Manic sixth chord goes right into his second theme. He doesn't have any development like he had in the exposition. He's right into that second theme. It's this second part of the B major theme. of his original theme. It's only in one bar. And again, what his satanic theme. time we went no but list is not 
not choose to do that again. Instead, he takes that downward theme, the downward octave, and he creates this wonderful... He's taken a, and that has become the point of his coda and his climax. And he takes his theme and he introduces it in major. like he ends his exposition, will not leave you alone. Listen to what he does. It's a phenomenon in music history because he doesn't let you forget where he's coming from. Steam. This is how it's transformed. Remember these?
an amazing end. The coda brings back all the elements that he's lived through. His theme. the very beginning, the full cycle, in a way, full cycle of life. He refuses to be conventional. second, keeping the famous Phrygian half-step. A minor, F major, finally resolving to the B major. final resolution of the C dying at the B. Well, I've now completed my rendition and sort of explanation of the B minor sonata. Uh, as you can imagine, um, this is only part of how this piece is constructed and there will be generations after me explaining the piece. Uh, but I wanted to sort of put myself and whoever is watching this video in, in the place of what history was like and where Franz Liszt was in the year 1853 when this piece was completed. Uh, what, what is most important to understand of Liszt is that this was the consummate musician. This was somebody who knew the gypsy music of Hungary. He had studied uh, all the Beethoven sonatas. He was a pupil of Czerny at a very young age. He ha was an intimate friend of Frederick Chopin. Even the fantasy of Schumann was dedicated to him. He knew every musician of his time, and by that matter, he knew writers, he knew painters, he knew dramatists, he knew all the opera composers. And he was, what you have to really believe is that what was going on in Weimar even, he was conducting the orchestra, so he had the entire orchestra in his ears. He uh, was an intimate friend of Richard Wagner by then. Berlioz played an enormous role in his life, so he was, all the music that had been written, all the dramatic music which had been written up to that time, uh, was in his ears. Besides being one of the greatest pianists of all time, uh, he wanted to put down in the sonata all the music and all the ex expressions of music that he has heard. Uh, Joachim played an important role playing the Beethoven quartets for him. Music was going on all the time. He was consumed by it. And of course, when he's sitting about to write a sonata, he's competing with all the great sonatas which had already been written. Uh, certainly, uh, the Chopin sonatas are no slouch, and certainly the Schumann sonatas are no slouch, and Mendelssohn was no. This, so this man is competing, he's putting down something which is so significant to him. And of course, his listening library, what he had heard by all the other composers, oh, we have to also mention Carl Maria von Weber because even he played the Weber sonatas and actually had transcribed the famous Der Freischutz, the, the opera of, of uh, Carl Maria von Weber. So besides being able to read full scores at sight, being able to transcribe the myriad of Schubert songs which he had transcribed, all the opera paraphrases which he had transcribed, he knew music backwards and forwards. And this piece was a consummate 
declaration of his life. Um, it was basically one of the last of great piano pieces that he, he had written. Uh, the Mephisto Waltz, which came later, and the, the Consolations and other pieces, uh, heretofore were later, but they certainly, this was the only sonata which he had set about to do. And certainly, he writes sonata, he didn't write fantasy, which was sort of a free form. He wanted a, a tight written sonata that would compete with all the great sonatas which had written, written previously. And certainly, I hope within the explanations and performance, and um, what should I say, showing how, what a dramatic work it was and what a personalized work it was, I believe you will see that uh, this is really a, a man who was before his time, of his time, and really had, as they had said, thrust his spear into the future. And this will be analyzed not only by me, but every pianist heretofore and every, everyone who had actually was a composer of the time because it was such a significant work and the, the use of more motivic explanation and transfiguration is really such an important part of the development of music. And of course we have the great Arnold Schoenberg and the serial music and the use of motivic development and this is why the piece is so important. It's important as a piece of music and to me it's important as a personal declaration of the life of Franz Liszt. Thank you.